fantastic. Well, welcome back everyone to the fifth uh, session of our series, our Lenten series on an exploration into death and dying. And today um, we have guests with us who have been with us several times already. Um, this is Matt and his wife, Kelly, right behind. And this is a family business. Uh, Matt Miley and his wife uh, have a practice in Windsor, and they have been attending the series. And today uh, we're focusing on uh, legal aspects that surround our deaths. Uh, just looking forward one more week, um, our sixth session will cover church funeral plans, alternative burials, and our remains, and then we'll have a wrap up. So that's uh, next Sunday. No homework for next Sunday that I'm aware of. All right. So we'll begin our session today uh, with a practice and hope you brought your linking item. May yes. I ask you one word? Yes. The lawyer brought one piece of paper. <laughs> John said, oh, of course we get stuff from lawyer. One sheet. Fewer than any of the other sessions. <laughs> you know, I'm an estate planner, and I wouldn't be leaving much of a legacy if I used all the trees. <laughs> okay, uh, Alex. So our just brief opening exercise is to turn in groups of two or three, and those on Zoom, just kind of chat amongst yourselves. And if you brought your linking object, Share just really briefly what it is, who it reminds you of. If you didn't bring it, that's okay. Think of something that you might have wanted to bring. And then see if you can name what that thing represents to you or maybe what you channel when you with you. So these earrings were my mom's and so I kind of channel her steadfastness. And the scarf was my grandma. So I channel her um, feeling fabulous, her glamor. <laughs> so, Groups of two or three, and we'll wrap it back in about three minutes. So, real brief. This is the. So the uh, Alex just asked Zoom people to share their stories. One yeah, word, and just word. really briefly. One word. Really briefly. Yeah. One word. Yeah. The your your maybe your item and the word that comes to mind when you think about it. Really briefly. The couple through the <laughs> Dog lover. <laughs> I thought you wanted to be part of this. <laughs> um, Amy let, said dog tags and the word is service. Lyle says, uh, Felicia's people's artwork, words are creativity and motivation. And uh, Jana, uh, beloved aunt's pen, brought it with her. There it is uh, in this picture right here. Taking it on the Camino. Oh, wow. Oh. And for me, the um, what was the priest that married Rosanna and I? That I have a photo of that woman, and so I think of her whenever I look at the photo. Carol Ford says, um, "I wear my late husband's wedding ring as a reminder of his unconditional love." Marriage. Still. I just have a couple things from my grandparents that keep me inspired about. Uh, spirituality and creativity. Joe wearing her mother's November birthday <clears throat> reminds her of love and compassion for others. And okay, thank you. Thanks, those on Zoom. A couple people from the room want to share just real briefly your item and what it represents. Yeah, my late husband was a really brilliant, hardworking trial lawyer, fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers, a big prestigious honor. And he made little toys and he made hundreds of these toys that he just found a balance in life and that gave him real joy. And when he died, we had a plastic tub and there were 
oh, 10,000 little <laughs> wheels and those of every size, but he stamped, it's attorney at toys. <laughs> <laughs> and they're right beside his picture. Maybe one more. Um, this this uh, necklace was given to my grandmother who was born in 1878 by her aunt and uncle. And this is her aunt and uncle's picture. And my aunt teased on it. This year. <laughs> oh. And my grandmother gave it to my mother and my mother gave it to me. And it reminds me of strong women. You all, we know there are a lot more stories for this problem. So hopefully those can continue past our, our hour. But we'll turn it over to Matt. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Again, I'm Matt Miley, and uh, we office in Windsor, and uh, I am an estate planning attorney. I'm also do some things with elder law, uh, Medicaid planning, things like that. So quite a lot of uh, items that I could talk on, uh, but I tried to uh, keep it down to 30 minutes or less um, to uh, be able to answer some questions and things like that. So I, I got a handout that I've given to everybody, and that's kind of Got a couple goals there to, to give you some things to look at. Um, also to have a, a way to uh, define what I'm going to be talking about and kind of limit the scope. Uh, but also, if you have uh, questions on anything that I don't go over enough for your satisfaction, which could be quite a bit, go ahead and circle that. Maybe write a little bit of uh, notes there. And if you want to email us after this uh, to get some more information on that, feel free to, to do that because there's no way I can uh, cover the entire gambit of the legal aspects of uh, being uh, incapacitated and, and going through death. So uh, if you look at number one there, the, the first thing that I, I'm talking about here with goals of estate planning, at least in our office, it is that I want to control what I have all my life as long as I am able, then leave what I want to whom I want, the way I want, when I want, at the least possible cost and fees and taxes. So if we can kind of work with that uh, working definition, that will kind of give a, a scope of what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Um, but also uh, it allows us to uh, have a working definition that you can use with anybody that you want to do. So I think it's just pretty good. Um, and then our uh, firm is, is pretty client centric. So uh, I try to remember that um, God gave me two ears and one mouth and use that in proportion. Um, and I try to listen to my clients and see what they want to do and what they want to talk about and hear about their goals and aspirations when we're designing a plan for them. Because after all, designing an estate plan is kind of like writing the last, last chapter of your life. Um, if you want to be re remembered as being generous and you're currently not generous, we can write that last chapter, but we better start filling on the other chapters before you get there. So it is a lifetime process. Uh, in our office, we feel that we need to uh, work with you um, as, as a family. And we believe that once you sign the documents, the relationship starts and not when you get the documents, not as a transaction. And that is because estate planning, death and dying um, tend to change every year. Your family situations change. Uh, how they do things in Denver may change and how they do things in Washington, D.C. may change as well. And a perfectly good will that you got while you were in service for our country when you were single may not work now that you have a wife and three kids or a spouse and three kids, uh, because since those people aren't mentioned in that will, the first thing the judge has to decide is whether you meant to disinherit them or not. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's even better not having the old plan. Um, so we, it's just, I encourage you that once you do have a plan to just don't leave it in your um, safe deposit box. I mean, get it out, look at it, and make sure that you keep it up to date so it works when you need it, because you never know when the pickle truck's going to come hit you. So uh, the top eight, number two there, the top eight goals that most people have for their state plan, when they come into our office, the number one is kids protection. You know, so why am I bringing up kids protection here? Well, in Colorado, if you don't have a um, permanent guardian set for your children or even your grandchildren, since we don't have the next of kin law, what happens is while that guardian is being set up, your children or your grandchildren could go to foster care. And so if you know that, it's, it's very uh, easy to fix that by setting up temporary guardians and things like that. So if your, grand, if your children have not yet put you as uh, temporary guardians for your grandchildren, you need to let them know that that's what can happen and to please come in 
uh, or see somebody about getting that set up. And it doesn't have to happen, but that's the other thing. And then the, the other part about kids protection is when your child turns over 18. Once they turn 18, you send them off to college or whatnot, you can no longer make decisions for them because they're an adult. And if any of you have taken grandkids or children to the, the doctor when they went from 17 to 18, all of a sudden the front desk doesn't talk to you anymore, right? You don't have clearance to find out the HIPAA releases and things like that. You don't have the ability to make decisions for them. And that works for both medical and financial. So if you have uh, single children um, who are 42, 50, whatever age, but they don't have a spouse, they don't have a champion, it's a good idea to get this set up because again, as we saw in the medical powers of attorney, the way we do it in Colorado, if you don't have a next kin uh, pick is they get everyone who's interested in you over the age of 18 in the hospital room and you vote on who is going to be the medical power of attorney. So if you don't want you know, your, your exes and your parents and your mistresses all in the same room voting on what they're gonna do for you, you better get that um, set. The number two there, part B there is probate. A lot of people come in because they've heard about probate or they wanna know about more about probate or they don't, they wanna avoid probate. And what is probate? Well, probate's the way that Colorado uh, distributes your property to other people. Um, and you go through probate if you do not have a will or even if you do have a will. As we like to say, where there's a will, there's a probate. Um, you just need to go through it and the judge basically decides and helps you decide how things are going to be distributed. But more often, probate's about your creditors. And in our office, we define probate as a lawsuit against yourself, funded by yourself for the benefit of your creditors. Why, is, why do I say that? Well, the first thing you need to do is put the deceased person's name in the newspaper so that anyone that person... Uh, thinks that that person owes money to, that person can ask for that money to be paid. If you are a creditor and you wait 45 days after the person dies, you can open probate on your own. So it's really set up for the creditors and all the creditors to get paid before anything goes to your loved ones. So a lot of people wanna avoid that. Um, probate can take a, a little bit of time. Uh, probate can also uh, cost quite a bit of money because in Colorado, you're usually paying a attorney $400 an hour and uh, probate can last up to uh, at least a year and sometimes longer. So paying $400 an hour for a year even makes me shudder. Um, so that's, uh, that's why a lot of people uh, want to avoid probate and they come in and talk to, to us about that. The third big reason why people come in to talk to us is that incapacity piece. And I think uh, state planning is mainly about incapacity. Um, you know, once, once you pass, there's laws or you have a will or you can have a trust that can decide where the property goes. But the big thing and the sad thing is I see quite a bit is when someone can't make decisions for themselves or they, they have someone else making the wrong decision. Um, I had a uh, client come to me once whose uh, uh, daughter was uh, 42 years old and got in an automobile accident, had a traumatic brain injury. Um, she went to the hospital without a medical power of attorney her mom flew in from out of state, wanted to take her home and take care of her. Uh, in that room, since there wasn't a medical power of attorney, there was a vote between the ex-fiance, the boss, and a coworker. Uh, those three outvoted the mom on who got to take care of this person. And uh, it didn't sit well with mom, as you can imagine. So we went through probate process and, and uh, did a guardianship conservatorship hearing, emergency one. And about $12,000 in legal fees later, mom got to take her daughter home with her, which I submit should have happened right from the get-go if there would have been um, powers of attorney in place. So that is uh, that was a tragic thing. And I think the $12,000 would have been better spent on the, the health care than it was on attorneys. But, but that was happening because it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, done ahead of time. So incapacity is a really good reason why we help folks um, work with things so they can pick people that they know, like, and trust to make their decisions for them and to find people who are going to make decisions the same way that you would make the decisions had you had the chance and not leave it to be appointed to a judge who you've never met, he or she, and make that decision for you. 
Um, the third one is disinheriting loved ones. And that kind of comes about because if you don't have a will in place, the Colorado statutes basically say that your property, if you're married, goes to your spouse. Okay, nothing goes to your kids as long as you had those two kids together. So just it just goes to the spouse. And that's just the way it goes because the uh, legislature who put those laws in effect just assume that the spouse would take care of their kids, which is fine. Um, but a lot of us uh, maybe die a little sooner than we wanted to and we end up getting remarried. 77% um, of my clients get remarried. I, something about being married the first time breaks you down so you don't say no the second time, I guess. Or it's the economics of the deal where you, you know, one of you has to work just to pay the taxes so the other one can feed the family. But for whatever reason, they all get married. And if you continue to not have a plan, it continues to go from spouse to spouse if you die before the other spouse. And eventually the third or fourth spouse has no relationship to your children. So you can basically end up disinherit them if you don't have a plan in place uh, to help them out. Um, lost property comes in is also one of the uh, probate processes. It's the favorite part of the will that I like reading those um, is the part of the will that says all my rest, remainder and residue, I leave to my kids 50-50 if you have two kids or if you have three and you don't like one. Um, so the rest, remainder and residue, a lot of times we're sitting around the table with the kids trying to figure out what that means. And in the old days, and when I say old days, I've been doing this since 1988, so uh, a little while ago, but uh, in the old days, we just would switch the mail to our office and we could find out what the person owned because there'd be bills and, and bank statements and things like that. Well, now it's all on your phone. Um, most of us won't pay the extra $5 to get the paper copy. So now we don't have access to the phone because the, the person who died forgot to give us the password and we're trying to figure out what rest, remainder, and residue means. Well, if you're a custodian of uh, funds like a life insurance policy or a bank account or something like that, and you don't know where that goes, you can legally turn it over to the state of Colorado after three years. So you can use it, get the interest off it, make money on it for three years, and then legally turn it over to the state of Colorado as unclaimed property. My question is how much, how hard are these people really looking for you when they get to use all these uh, funds for free? But anyway, um, and it goes to this, uh, unclaimed property. If you look at unclaimed property now in the state of Colorado, there's over $600 million in that. And that's just uh, people who uh, forgot to do things. I actually got $50 in it. Um, I was uh, went to school up in Wyoming and I had a credit union account with $50 in it to keep it open. And I didn't contact them for three years. So they just sent it to Colorado. Kind of made me mad because I knew I was in Colorado. Why didn't just contact me and give me my money? But I got fifty dollars, and that's my retirement plan, so I can get the. <laughs> um, so that's lost property. Um, the other, uh, the next thing a lot of people come in to talk to us about is to protect loved ones, and protect loved ones. There is a way that you can leave property to your loved ones so that it stays in the bloodline, and it won't be available to creditors and predators. Now, creditors are the people like you see those late night. Uh, plaintiff's attorneys that make all attorneys look so good. Um, or it could be a bankruptcy court. Um, predators, we call those usually the spouses who wanna get a divorce. Um, but there is a way that you can uh, leave your property once you die so that no one else can touch that. And we can uh, you know, talk more about that uh, at a later time or get you more information on that. But there, there is a way where, um, let's say that you had a house that was fully paid for uh, it was worth 500,000. You have two kids. So, you know, they're getting 250,000 each. So you can decide You say, Hey, that's enough to start my life over with. I think 250,000 would be enough. If someone took everything that my kids had in a nasty divorce or, or some kind of, uh, uh, bankruptcy or a lawsuit, they could have this $250,000. I left each one of them to start their life over. And is that worth it to me to do that? And there are ways to, to do that. There's ways to, to, uh, to leave that. So we'll stay in the, in the uh, bloodline and it won't, uh, uh, won't go to creditors. Um, and then the final uh, reasons there, a couple of reasons there, a lot of people have outdated plans. So they'll come in and, and I already mentioned that a little bit, dangers of those. And then uh, trust funding is what we call it, but that's just a legal term for, if you have a trust, you got to put things in the trust for it to work the trust doesn't work um, unless you put things into it, okay? So um, 
And I always ask my clients, you know, if we could only address one problem above, which one it be? You can kind of circle that one to see which one lands the hardest on you. With a lot of my younger clients, it's the first one, it's kids protection, but uh, some people like the asset protection, those kind of things. And we just talk a little bit about what is the best way to protect those people. Okay, so um, let me, let me uh, kind of change gears right there. Those, those are the goals that most people come in. And if any of those goals kind of raise some uh, issues with you, just circle that, our uh, um, emails on the bottom of that page and, and you're more than welcome to ask for more information on any one of those or, or to come in. We'd love to, love to talk with you about any of those things. Um, but let's talk a little bit now about the differences between a uh, trust and a will. I need my cup, please. I need my trust. Okay, so um, forgive me, I used to teach middle school. So when you own things with either a will or without a will, basically you have, you hold all the title in your hand, right? You're holding it really, really tight. And these are all markers, but what, what could they be? What is your estate? Well, in Colorado, your estate is like your house, your any other rental real estate, vacation home, office building, mineral rights, timeshare, bank accounts, business entities, brokerage accounts, um, any of your vehicles, your personal property, you know, all those guns you have, those little uh, gold coins you have hidden in the um, <laughs> coffee cans in the backyard, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, uh, it can be your artwork, your jewelry, your furs, your furniture, your boats, your airplane, it's all that stuff. And you're holding all the title in your hands, right? And it's like, well, man, I really don't have a title on my couch. Well, that's probably true, but if I went to your house and started walking, well, I have to have two people. But we started taking your couch out the front door, you'd say, hey, that's mine. And you know, the judge would agree. So those are all yours. And you're hanging on to them like this because they're, they're all yours, right? And so when you die, what happens? You drop them. Now, in, in Colorado, if this amount of stuff that was dropped that does not have a way to get to someone, is if that's over $80,000, right? Or if it's real estate. Of course, if you have a house that's worth less than $80,000 in Colorado, <laughs> I don't want to see it. Um, <laughs> But if it's over $80,000, you're going to need to go through some kind of probate. So what happens is they, uh, either your will says it or the statute says it, you got to find a champion. you got to find someone who's going to take your cause to the courts. And this is why wills and trusts are very important for single people because they don't have like the, the spouse who has an interest to get all the, the property or they don't have uh, kids or something like that to, to come, come in and take it. So you got to get someone appointed. This usually takes uh, two or three weeks. You get these things called letters of testamentary, which are the keys to everything. Once you have those, you can do all, a lot of things, but those are the, the uh, um, they're only issued during probate. But you find a champion who goes through and they're gonna come pick up all your stuff, right? And they're gonna find it. And they're sitting around my table saying, what does rest remainder and residue means? But we're gonna find it all. And you look at who it goes to and with the, after you pay the creditors with the court's permission, you then give that to who it belongs to. Notice I lost one, so that's going to go to unclaimed property because we couldn't <laughs> find that one. Um, so that's, that's how a will works. It's just basically, you got, you got to find who owns the title after you pass. Now, what's the difference with a trust? Well, trust is like this cup here. So what you do is you develop a trust and you, you just set it up and this thing is going to hold your property. So while you're live and you know where everything is, you retitle everything and put it into that trust. And so you're retitling it from you as an individual to you as a trustee. This particular trust is, is what they call a revocable trust, which is just attorney speak for, it's not really an entity in and of itself. It doesn't change your taxes. You still use your social security number for it. The IRS doesn't even care that you have a trust. It's just a way to avoid probate, basically. And how does it avoid probate? Well, now the trust owns everything. And you have a successor trustee. A successor trustee is like a, a second manager who uh, manages your property when you, you go. It's like if you had a business, everything was owned by the business. When the business owner was gone, the, uh, the second in command could, could take over. But that's what the trust is. And basically, when you die, you just hand it off 
to the trustee. You're not going through probate for a year. You're not going through the court to get another bank account set up. The trust owns everything. And you're just a signer. The bank already knows you're a signer in an account. So you're signing checks within a, a few days, which is very important when you're trying to maintain property and the taxes are coming due and the utilities and everything like that, and not waiting a couple months to have the court approve you. So that's the nice thing about trust. But the great thing about trust is that can also happen during your incapacity. Okay, if you're no longer allowed to uh, sign checks, which is what the legal definition of inc incapacity is for state planning, okay, you don't have to be drooling or anything like that. It's just like every time the Prince of Dubai calls you, you send him a Walmart card. You probably shouldn't be doing the checks anymore. So that's what it is. But now your loved ones can use your property to take care of you. Okay, when you have a will, it only goes when you pass, right? So if you got a will and you're incapacitated, you're not letting go of this stuff. Because the first thing we do when we become incapacitated is we know we're losing control, we get a little stubborn, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, so how do your uh, loved ones pay for you if you're in that nursing home that's costing 12,000 a month? They're putting it on their credit card. And then when you, when you die and finally let go, they're now a creditor like all the other ones in your, um, in your will and in your probate, okay? So that's a visual look at the uh, a difference between a will and a trust, okay? Um, just to go into asset protection a little more, this is a revocable trust because the top's open. Why is the top open? Well, because this is a contract and it's a contract between the grantor, which is a fancy attorney word, for the person who wrote the trust, the trustee, which is a fancy attorney word for the person who manages the trust on behalf of the grantor, and they do it for the beneficiaries. And while you're alive and you have capacity, you're all three of those. So you have a contract between me, myself, and I. So it's like, hey, self, can I take stuff out of this? Oh, sure, right? That's a contract. Well, once you pass, what happens is another trustee takes over. You don't have that agreement Three, between three people because the grantor has now died. And that just basically puts a trustee on top of this who gives permission to the person to take things out. It's like, hey, uh, Uncle Bob, can I buy a Ferrari? No. Uh, can I go to school? Yes. Can I marry Bubbles? No. <laughs> that's what gets the asset protection. And when you have the top on it, that's what turns it into a revocable trust, okay? It's just basically that trustee needing to get permission. So that's how you can get those to work. Um, but that's the difference between um, uh, wills and trusts. Do you have some questions? Mm -hmm. So, as a, as a lawyer, would you say that we have a trust? You know, we have will, but do you think it is a good idea to have a trust? I, the question was, do I think it's a good idea to have a trust? And, and um, you know, just we just for total, you know, uh, disclosure, trust costs a little more than a will. OK, but you do get a void probate, which is the you pay up front instead of at the end. So I just want to get that out there, out there. But, yeah, I I agree because of the incapacity piece. I think the trusts are superior. Um, let's let's go ahead and uh, do I have like 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, let's go ahead and just let me tell you what um, I recommend here at the end there for uh, the top 10 recommendations for a, a comprehensive plan. And then you, we can talk a little bit about more for that. So at the end there, um, number uh, four, uh, this is what I recommend uh, for a comprehensive estate plan. What, you know, what I've done for myself and I've done for a lot of my clients. So first of all, I, rec I do recommend a trust because I don't like probate. Okay, I've had a lot of problems with probate. I've had some that are about, uh, they're going on their 15th year uh, to get it done. Um, but that it's, it's unusual circumstances. We had four people on the, uh, on the property, the real estate, um, three are dead and the fourth one's in jail. So it's just, it's just been, it's, it's a case that keeps on giving. Um, the, uh, I also believe in a, in a kids protection plan, which is number two, and that's whether they're under 18 or over 18. Um, I just think that there's nothing worth, worse for a parent to not be able to help their children, regardless of their age. 
So we're really we're really adamant on that, and we've we've talked a little bit about that in this these series before. That's mainly that uh, medical power of attorney, um, to to help help with a lot of those. Make sure that you have the ability to either make decisions for them or you have someone who can make decisions for them. Uh, C is the pour over will. So with a trust, you still have a will, but it's a pour over will. And for the people online, it's P O U R, not P O O R. Um, but a pour over will says, if we forgot to put everything into our trust, it just takes that and pours it into the trust. Okay, so it's a safety net. A lot of times you have everything in the trust, you won't ever have to have to do the probate or anything like that. And remember the 80,000 figure, if you have less than 80,000 figure outside of the trust, it, it would you would just get poured in there with a what's called a small estate affidavit, which we can talk about in a little bit here too. Um, the second, the third thing, fourth thing there is durable financial power of attorney. So we haven't talked about that in this series yet, but that's, we got the medical power of attorney and that's the agent who makes medical decisions for you. The financial power of, of attorney is the one who makes decisions for you. And that can either be, you can either set it up that they can make decisions for you immediately or only until you've been proved to be incapacitated, which is typically a, uh, um, a physician or a licensed psychologist who can make that decision. So that, again, you shouldn't be writing checks, but you need the financial part because there's two parts of our lives. There's one where they're making decisions medically and you know, kind of lifestyle, and then the other one's the first string, so financial one. So you, you definitely need a financial power of attorney and those uh, need to have certain things in it um, other than the one that they let you have statutory. Uh, you should have a few things in it, like allow people to get into your digital assets, allow your agent to talk to uh, government officials in case you, you, you were, had a healthcare, long-term healthcare type of deal where you needed to work with Medicaid and things like that. But uh, those are very important to have a durable financial power of attorney. If you have a trust, Everything that's in the trust will be handled by the trust, even during your incapacity. So the financial durable power of attorney is not as important. If you have a will, the financial durable power of attorney is the only way that your agent's going to be able to take care of you if you're incapacitated. Please note that the trustee has a fiduciary duty to do the right thing, where the agent in a financial power of attorney can make it whatever mistake you could make as, a, as an agent. So um, that's, that's a difference there. And a lot of times banks will take a trust a little more readily than they'll take a, a financial power of attorney. Um, personal property memorandum, very important. Uh, I've seen millions of dollars pass and that was fine, but it was the personal property that made the family not have um, uh, any more reunions or, or barbecues or things like that. I was at one uh, funeral where all the kids skipped and went to the house to switch the post-it notes on the furniture. Um, so, you know, that, that, that will derail things quicker than anything. So just make sure if you have an item you want to give to somebody that you have either a trust or will to allow you to, to give that to them. And then all the rest remainder and residue can go to cover. Um, uh, the healthcare power of attorney, we've talked quite a bit of, about that. Um, you guys have a, a one that was handed out. Uh, again, when you're incapacitated, you might want to add some provisions in there, like, please keep me in my home as long as possible. Um, if the pain medicine is making me feel good, but it's speeding up my demise, it's okay. I'd rather feel good and then live a long time. You can add to the medical powers of attorney uh, quite a bit so people know what to do, including allowing uh, your agent to take you out of state uh, if Colorado's not doing what you want them to do. Um, the advanced directive, which is a living will, it's called a living will. Notice it has no relationship to the last will and testament. The living will just says what's going to happen to you if you're in a, a persistent vegetative state or terminal condition, how many days do you want to stay on life support and or artificial nutrition and hydration. Mm -hmm. Um, HIPAA releases, those are the ones that allow people to know about you, but they can't make decisions. So you may have an agent that you want to make all your decisions, but you may have other relatives who you want to give the right to call the hospital, find out how you're doing, but they can't touch you. Um, memorial instructions, I gave you an example of that on the back of the, the page I gave you, just a real simple one. Again, the money can usually find its way where it's supposed to go. 
but if you don't know what happens when um what you want the how you want the person to be taken care of uh that's really hard on the family um okay so and then the last uh there after the memorial instruction is the certificate of trust and this is a document that's in two pages, it tells everybody who has your money that you have a trust, so you don't have to show them what's in the trust. Because a trust is private, a will is not private. So we, uh, we know a will is not private because we can look up online and find out that Jackie Onassis gave somebody by the name of Bunny Ferguson $375,000. Why do I know that? Because she had a will. Where uh, Walter Payton, when he died, uh, had a buddy in Chicago doing his trust and the sports desk called and said, um, you know, we want to know where Walter left all his money. And the attorney said, well, I don't have to tell you because it's in a trust. And the sports editor said, well, we'll see about that. Never called back. So trust them all right. <laughs> so uh, th those are my recommendations. Like I say, I'd love to um, talk to you more about this. If you just let me know and I'll open it up for questions. Mm -hmm. um, our son is going to be getting married this summer, and congratulations. Talked about, they talked about getting having prenuptial agreements, but they're not done it yet. And so, if they don't get it done, is there anything that we can do with trusts that would help them there? With their money or your money? Our money. Okay. So the, the question was the that uh, getting a, having a marriage and. Uh, we like to call those marital agreements now. The prenuptials got kind of a stigma, but uh, kids may not get around to uh, marital agreements, which is quite common. Well, don't you love me? <laughs> um, so, uh, and can we can we protect what we're leaving them? And the answer is yes, you can. And the best way to do that is through a trust. Now, a trust can you can either start with a trust that turns irrevocable, or you can start with a will that asks the judge to set the trust up for you. But either way, you wanna get a trustee on there, which can be your son, right? Your son can be the own trustee, but what happens is he's gotta get permission for that money. And so it stays in the bloodline because it doesn't go to the spouse. It's never really available, it's separate. You can also put it, you know, Uncle Bob or whoever has another trustee on there. Um, and in our trust, when we're asked to, we'll write the requirement of a prenuptial agreement. So if anyone ever gets remarried, the new spouse has to admit that that's not their, not their money to get remarried. And it's more of a loving way to uh, ask for a prenup because it's, you know, it's like, uh, well, don't you love me? Oh, I, I do, but I'm going to have to give up all this money if you don't sign it. Oh, okay. And I'd like to buy you a new dress. Okay, I'll sign it. <laughs> So yes, they, absolutely. And that's one of the main reasons people do that is because for some reason, some parents don't like the spouse as well as the kids do. I've got a question from Zoom. Mm -hmm. If all assets and liabilities are in both spouses' names, would there still be probate if something wasn't covered in the will? So yeah, if, if so joint tenancy, which we didn't get time to talk about, but joint tenancy, so the, the question is, yeah, um, unless you marry a, or you have joint tenancy with a spouse or a person that's immortal, <laughs> there's going to eventually be a probate. You can move it down the line a little bit, but if both uh, uh, spouses own it and they're on a trip and the pickle truck hits them both, that's a, that's a probate. So that's a danger with... Um, uh, joint tenancy is that you're you're looking at it and you're saying, okay, uh, I'm going to die in this order, and uh, you know I'm going to die first. Some people do it with their kids, and I I'm always looking at them in amazement because they're in an assisted living where they have these little things where they can pull if they hurt and they get three square meals and they don't have to go anywhere and people are taking care of them, and they're going to die first and their kids are going up and down I-25 to come visit them. It's like. <laughs> Maybe not. So uh, it just it can delay uh, probate, but it won't it won't get rid of probate. Yes, Dad, see, 
I would part C if, if um, the two people aren't married, but they've been living together for over 10 years. Is that a merit? Wow. It can be. Um, I hate to say it depends. Um, so if. Don't say depends to this group. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, I, yeah, we're, we're vintage lawyers. Um, the, uh, it depends on how, it, how is the couple carrying out, okay? So some people have been living together for a long time, have kids, and when other people refer to them as husband and wife, they don't correct them. And that turns into what we call a common law marriage over time. Um, the, which, comes up usually when the person dies and the common law want to be marriage wasn't left anything and the kids are now trying to take all the money and the and the spouse that's left is like you know what i'm going to go prove marriage and then i get the statute say i get half of things like that so um marriages and, and uh your spouse can kind of undo your will at times you can elect to go against the will if you're not left the amount of money that you're supposed to get, which is if you've been married 10 years or longer in Colorado is half, it, it graduates up. So you're entitled half at that point. So. Well, thanks, it's just, um, it's a question I never thought I'd ever ask, but here we are. I, you know, and, and a, a trust can handle that as well, because mm -hmm. you can have a joint trust, you can have two separate trusts and just identify what's what. And then as part of doing the trust, you can do the marital agreement which says, as far as our trust goes, this is my property and I'm allowed to give it to whoever, and this is my property I'm allowed to give to whoever, and you can have that, you can have that all set up ahead of time so that no one's pulling the fast one when you pass. Another Zoom question. Um, is a codicil, codicil legal in Colorado? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, codicil or codicil is an attorney word for amendment to a will. Um, and we, we can't use uh, regular uh, language because we wouldn't be able to charge so much if we spoke English, but it's an amendment. Um, and it needs to be uh, codicil to be uh, valid in Colorado needs two witnesses. And with addresses and the, it, get it notarized, okay? Um, I have one right now where it had one witness, wasn't notarized, we're in probate. We're trying to figure out what's going to go on. Um, we, you know, it's a house that was left to five people or six people, so it means a lot. But we're trying to figure it out. Yes. Over here. Over here. Mm -hmm. well, I have a sister whose husband died through an estate, and the, everything automatically went to her. That's how they set it up. The trust or the will or the court. Uh huh. So it can be done. That everything can go to the spouse? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And if there is one item or something that's left, they can do a mini or small probate to take care of that. Yeah, it, it can be done if things go right. My, I look at uh, what happens if they both would have died together. Okay. And, and that's the, that's the problem. And that's, you know, you got to kind of look through this through my lens too. I never get the real good, simple ones. They don't come into my office and say, Hey, can we give you some money? Cause we got this already done. Sure. Um, you know, we, we're seeing the ones that just didn't work because it, life didn't go the way they planned. From the original, yeah, um, we had a jar where people could ask questions anonymously. So I want to kind of give voice to those. So okay. We, there's a group of questions there. We have a diverse range of incomes in our community, mm -hmm. and so there are a group of questions about people who are just wondering, like, when is the cost of involving an attorney worth it? If I have limited assets, and so I guess I'd be kind of comparing the assets to the the cost of probate eventually or the cost of an attorney now. So if you could just adjust that, limited me. Okay, so um, the so the cost of, of probate in Colorado, there isn't is not a statute that says it's a certain percentage of the 
uh, estate like it is in well, our neighbors in Wyoming. It's 2% in Wyoming. So if you had a uh, $500,000 house, probably it'd be $10,000. Um, in Colorado, uh, you can find people who do flat fee, but most attorneys will do it on a retainer hourly. And like I said, it, it goes at least uh, a year typically to, to do that. So um, it's around $5,000, I would say, to, um, to do a probate. Again, uh, the complexity and all that is going to change. Um, when you don't, uh, when you don't open a probate, sometimes the banks and the life insurance companies and the um, people who have the money they won't even talk to the personal representative unless they have letters of testamentary, which can only be obtained through probate. So um, sometimes just to get to the the sixty thousand dollar funds in an IRA or something like that, we have to go to probate to get those, those letters so that the, the, uh, um, the broker of the IRA fund will even talk to us because we're not even the person whose IRA it is. So, uh, you know, that's, that's what you're looking at. So if you can get a, a plan for less than that, um, I would say it'd be worth it, especially since it's gonna help your incapacity um, up to that point. So Matt, if a, if a probate is going to be $5,000 and the trust is going to be $5,000, it's kind of what you said earlier, pay me now or pay later. It's the same, same essential cost. It, it, yeah, it, it, it can be. And, and uh, the, you know, the 80,000, that threshold I gave you was, uh, um, 70 was 76,000 last year. Uh, and so that, so state of Colorado said there's been 8% inflation from last year to this year. And that's typically how the probate charges for getting into court and everything, their inflation as well. And as we all get more vintage, um, we're putting a lot of pressure on the, the probate courts. So, um, you know, I think they're going to, I think probate costs are going to go up. A little bit. Do you have another one? Yeah. When in the beginning, when you mentioned the probate, I thought I understood, but it's been coming up. And so, what I'd like to ask you is to elaborate a little bit, I'll give an example, so that I really grasp what it means. About probate? Yeah. Okay, so when someone dies, uh, the law gives you 10 days to find the will and file it with the court. It's got to be the original or you have to, if you can't find the original, you have to go through a lot of uh, extra um, steps to get that will approved. Um, once you have that in there, you are, hopefully the will says, this is who I want to be my personal representative. In Colorado, it's called a personal representative rather than an executor or executrix like it's called in other states. And so if you get that person appointed, then that person now can get the letters of testamentary, which allows them to open up a bank account, which is called the estate account, because they can't use the money. The first thing that happens uh, with your banks and, and your statements is that they, they freeze your bank accounts. So pretty soon, you're, right from the get-go, your personal representative has no funds to, to pay for anything. So they, ha they didn't have to get that permission from the court. Um, we send out uh, a newspaper article saying that this person is deceased. It needs to be published consecutively in a newspaper. And then we start waiting for creditors to call so we can start paying them off and make sure they get paid according to the statute before we give anything out to the, to the children or the, the kids. So that's the probate process in a nutshell. Let me get a little bit into the capacity part of this. In the sense of uh, you have these funds, and you get uh, uh, to take care of yourself and put into a home where you have to pay for this home. And the people who own this property belongs to has to pay a certain amount to these homes until they get down to. Under $100,000 or something like that. Is there a way to avoid that 
yes, <laughs> there is a way. Um, so, so six sixty months is the actual law, but yeah, it comes out to five years for the rest of us. Um, <laughs> that uh, yeah, so uh, it's about planning for Medicaid. So um, long term health care. Uh, Medicare will pay for everything as long as it's rehab. Um, the minute it's long-term health, your rehab stop, stops. Medicaid will only pay for 20 days, and then they want reimbursed for the other 80 days you're on it. So you either private pay, you use long-term care insurance, or you uh, get government assistance. And to qualify for government assistance, you, uh, you can't have more than $2,000 in assets. So you hear a lot of people trying to spin that down to get there. Um, there is a way to either uh, gift it away or use the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. We don't tell Medicaid that's what, what it's called. Um, but you can put your money in a trust ahead of time, which washes the five years. It's an irrevocable trust, so it, it goes to your kids and they have control over it. So you got to have good kids. Um, but uh, you, can, you can do that and, and work with that. You no longer have ownership over the property. You don't have ownership, but the way we write them is that you have an occupancy right, because it's usually the house that we're worried about the most. So you have an occupancy right for the rest of your life. And if you wanted to substitute it for another house, you could do that and things like that. So they are they are somewhat flexible, but you're you're right, you lose control. You would recommend something like that. I have it. That's what I have. Yeah, I'm just saying yeah. we have to protect ourselves. If, if you think yeah. you're gonna go to long-term care. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into whether or not I'd recommend that. There is, and you kind of look at family history and, and some of those kind of things. And and yes, we've we've got them set up for people, and and uh, they've uh, died the first month in in the nursing home. Um, excuse me, we call it skilled nursing facility. Um, and and you know, there's others that we we didn't get it up. Um, get it set up in time. Um, there's also what's called emergency Medicaid planning where we can immediately gift between some spouses and things like that and save approximately 40 to 50% of the estate and get the spend down as well. So there's there are some tools that we can use. And the reason we can use these tools is that Medicaid knows the system's broken. So they've thrown us a couple bones that we can use to make it work. There's an online question. Is there a ballpark amount of what it costs to set up a simple will with power of attorney, medical power of attorney included? Uh, yes, there are ballparks. A single person, I would assume, and not a family. Adult, um, they, you know, they're going to, uh, I would recommend if you do a will and you have a house, you also get what's called a beneficiary deed. To keep that out of probate, um, which, which costs a little more. So it's anywhere between, uh, for a will, you know, with all those 1500 to 2500 if you have a spouse or something like that. And then a trust would be maybe uh, 1500 more on top of that with all those documents. What are the drawbacks to revocable wills and revocable trusts? The drawbacks to revocable trusts. Um, are you talking about irrevocable? No. no. Yeah. Oh, no. The, the biggest. Uh, kind of hurdle when you have those is retitling everything into the name of the trust. So you really want to find a, a uh, if you're going to get a trust, you want to find someone who will help you with that. You know, it, we call it funding, but it's retitling. And that's kind of a hassle because you got to change everything over. Once you have that done, everything's owned by the trust and you buy any new things in the trust um, type of deal. Uh, but for, as long as it's revocable, there's not really a whole lot of administration costs and things like that with it. So uh, it's just setting it up that's kind of a, a hard thing to do. What do you mean by people to help you with retitling? What do you mean? Oh. My client service director. We show you how to do that. And my better seven eights. So yeah, we just uh, we didn't think it was fair if we if somebody wants a trust, we didn't think it was fair if it didn't work. 
So we've worked really hard to make sure that we have a process in place that it gets things put into it because uh, I thought if you sold someone a trust and you didn't make it work that it was malpractice, we'll come out to find out in Colorado, it's just common practice. You just, <laughs> here's your trust. Don't forget to put things in it. See ya. When you talk about retitling things, so the, my home, my investment, it'd be like under the, the Sheller Trust instead of under my name? Or Correct. That, okay. So we retitle it from you as an individual to you as a trustee. Okay. And anything that you had uh, uh, title on that didn't have like tax exempt status like IRAs and, and retirement accounts, we would change the ownership to the trust. The uh, retire retirement accounts, things like that, we change the beneficiary to the trust, right? So the idea is if you do want asset protection for your kids, why just do it for the house and then have this $500,000 IRA that just goes to them in a check. You know, we want that. If you're going to take the time, we'd want that to come through the trust so you still have it. But we look at all those situations so we can get it done correctly. Thank you. We're at about time. And fortunately, Matt has offered uh, his email for further questions that you might have and reaching out to, to them. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Absolutely. You want a book for your library? <laughs> This is the best estate planning book, Matt said. It's a bestseller. Okay. I'll leave it for your library. Wear clean underwear. Wear clean underwear. Yeah, if uh, we know some people have to leave, I'll scoot off the camera. Thanks. We know some people have to leave, so if you have to, go ahead. But we just wanted to kind of wrap up our wonderful hour of talking about the things we've inherited, the things that we want to leave behind and protect, and all the ways we want to leave a legacy for those we love. Just, um, I've been thinking about what are those intangible things as well. And for me, one of those things are prayers, songs, rituals, the things that get passed along to us spiritually, emotionally, that aren't tangible, but are very much part of that legacy. And I also wanted to share one of my best spiritual practices when I you need know, a little inertia and I'm having trouble finding a spiritual practice is to turn to chants or songs. So I wanted to share one of my favorite ones that we'll play. And it's one that I intend to pass on to our song, to our son, hopefully around the campfire at some point. So our encouragement is to be thinking about those intangibles too that we pass on as part of our legacy. We don't know what the linking objects are gonna be that our loved ones will attach to but we can kind of infuse some gifts of uh, different types of treasures into what we leave behind. So this is called the mother's response and it comes from the Kohenet Jew uh, Jewish community by sung by Riv Shapiro. And it's one of my favorites to kind of grab myself. So we'll kind of close with this. Okay, and then we leave yeah. in silence after this. Is and then leave in silence. Oh, we we'll, do we yeah, have, we'll have some music for ourselves uh, ending again. So if people want to stay, they're welcome to and please leave us. Slow down, child, slow.
Child, slow down, slow down and listen to the wind. All comes together, all falls apart, forming a new your beating heart. Slow down, child, slow down. stories now it is safe to be
Thank you, Al. What happens to all the automatic bill page that happens to Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Thank you, everyone. See you next week.